I think we will start off with our next session, right? And um, as soon as I, I hope that as soon as they hear the talk, they're going to come in, right? But thank you for being back with us. Uh, and uh, for the next talk, uh, we have Pratham. So he's going to be introducing container internals, uh, what control groups are, what namespaces are, and how do they all fit into, uh, you, you know, give us the container uh, that we know today. Right? I'll just close the doors at the back. Tell me if it's better. Yeah. Just be loud. This should be loud. Yeah. Um, am I audible? Yes, I can make do with the that mic. Yeah, it's, how about now? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so should I start or? Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so, hi everyone. I hope I'm properly audible now. So, I'm Pratham. I'm a high school pass out. I work at a startup. Okay, that's very original. So, we'll, today we'll be talking about how, how Docker works, you know, about all the components are involved in making all this all these things work. There's namespaces, there's C groups, you might have heard of them. But we'll be going a bit in depth as well. So we'll learn about what union file systems are like. You might have heard of overlay FS. So we'll be going into that as well. So just let me know if you were able to make out all the words or if it's muffled or something. It's fine? Okay. So yeah. So first uh, we'll actually Look at what Docker actually means, right? Because Docker itself is not much. There's a lot of underlying components that make everything work. Yes, yeah, so whenever we use the Docker cli, right, it just sells out to the Docker daemon. And the Docker daemon itself only handles the relatively high level parts like building images and all that. And the heavy lifting of running the containers it ha is handled by container D, which in turn shells out to container runtimes like run C. There's a lot of other ones as well, like run or whatever, right? So the focus of this talk will be mainly on how run C works. That is the core containerization logic. Okay, and any questions about this? No? Okay. Right. So when we run a Docker container, like we should first we'll see what exactly it isolates from the host, right? It's a sandbox. So we have to see what exactly is being isolated. And then we'll learn how we can do that ourselves. So. Okay, so first of all, we can see that obviously the PID namespace is isolated. PIDs in the container start from one, not from 10,000 or whatever. It would be if you ran it on the host directly. So one thing is this, and the other thing is obviously the, the root file system itself is isolated. We're, we're running the Alpine file system, and we cannot access any files from the host directly. And the... And a slash dev slash proc, all of those fi pseudo file systems are also isolated. I, like, I cannot see my GPU in, in slash dev. And uh, the network is also isolated. It, it has its own network. It's a bridged Ethernet device created using kernel APIs. It's zero, so that just acts as a bridge between the network inside the container and the host. Okay, so now we will uh, yeah. we'll go on to create something like this from scratch. Uh, but before that, let me know if all of that made any sense or not. Okay, I guess it did. Right. 
तो राइट सो दिस एग्जाम्पल इज रिटन इन रस्ट बट यू डोंट नीड टू नीड नो एनी रस्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड इट इट्स वेरी स्टैंडर्ड सिस्कॉल्स माइट अफोर्ड ऑफ द क्लोन सिस्कॉल फॉर क्रिएटिंग अ न्यू प्रोसेस राइट इट्स द सेम स्टेप वी सेट अप अ न्यू स्टैक फॉर द चाइल्ड प्रोसेस एंड द ओनली थिंग वी हैव टू डू हेयर इज वी हैव टू टेल द कर्नल टू क्रिएट ऑल दीज न्यू नेम स्पेसिस फॉर द प्रोसेस सो वी हैव अ माउंट नेम स्पेस सो वी कैन हैव एन आइसोलेटेड स्लैश डेव स्लैश प्रॉग एंड एवरीथिंग we have a pid name space that we saw a network name space and here we creating a user name space which basically allows us to do all of these things rootlessly right and in the child process this will just execute a shell so we can play around with it launched a container the original sandbox has a pid of 5680 but inside the container will be pid 1 right because the namespace is isolated from the host and similarly if we try to look at the network devices we won't be able to access the network at all right there's no devices there's no bridge device there's no nothing these are all just the dummy devices that come from the corner so doing something like curl won't work Okay, and also when you run Docker, you might have seen that we root inside the container, but we don't actually have root privileges. So for that, the kernel provides us with the uh, these APIs called UID mappings and GID mappings. So does everyone here know what UIDs and GIDs actually mean? If you've ever done traditional systems administration, okay, raise your hand if you know what UIDs and GIDs are. No one. you know i mean like what they actually mean in practice it right? okay, so they are basically just for you know deciding who should be able to access what yeah oh uh, it's slide uh, it's a go program called slides it's just called slides the slides are written in markdown and yeah tick 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 hmm oh, it's a go program you can run it anywhere Yeah. Okay, so a bit more on UIDs. So here my my user is test user, right? It has a UID of one thousand. That means it can only access files that are made for UID one thousand. And obviously, root has UID zero. It it can do anything. So now we want to be the UID zero inside the net container without actually being having the privileges that uid0 has so for that these uid gid mappings they just emulate it sort of right so in the container whenever we check what our uid is we'll get that we are uid0 but we'll actually have the privileges of uid1000 and similarly for other users like others like if you create another user inside the container that would also have a uid map to an unprivileged uid on the host so this is the only new piece of code that's been added we just map uid 0 to 1000 and similarly the group id 0 to 1000 so now when we run the container we'll see that we're actually root without being root yeah 
so we uid is zero and but we cannot actually do anything that uid zero can so any doubts about this Right, so that's all good, but now we'd like to have networking inside the container working, right? Like a container is pretty useless if you cannot use the network from it. So right now, if we see, we obviously do not have any network devices that we can use. So for this, what we can do is the kernel basically has an API called tap devices. So you can create a tap device and all the uh, internet traffic could get routed through it right you can intercept it starts at layer two it's all the you get the raw ethernet frame and you can do whatever you want with it so basically there is this project called slurp for network namespaces so it goes into the container it basically changes its namespace so it points to the container namespace right it creates a tap device there and all the container traffic gets routed through the tap device outside the host, uh, outside the container, right? So it's a bit tricky to explain. So slurp creates a child process. That child process creates a tap device inside the container. And then that child process gives control of that tap device back to the host. It's all the traffic that goes through the tap device. Slope will route it through the host name, a uh, host interface. Uh, that was quite a bit. So let me know if you have any doubts. Yeah. yeah, so this is not creating a bridge. Let me just show you. Wait, let me, let me just, yeah. So, yeah, so our thing is spawned with the, for PID 6277. So we'll just set that up with slope. Right, so now I ran slope right with that PID and it created a tab zero tab device inside the container. So now what would happen is whenever I make any request, it would get routed to tab zero, which would then forward everything to slope, which would then forward everything to the host network interfaces. So it should work now. Wait. Oh, it should work. Yeah, so we have network working inside the container. So I'm blind. It's just 10 minutes. Okay. Right. right, so that was it for the main container logic. So now we'll, okay, let me just close this thing. Yeah, so now we actually look at what a Docker image means, right? So an image is basically nothing. It's just a collection of layers. And we look at what individual layers actually mean. Right? So this is an image manifest basically. So if you do Docker save any image, you'll get this manifest in that extra tarball. It just has layers, right? So this is the base layer. And this is another layer on top of it. And this is again yet another layer on top of it. So I'll illustrate this with a Docker file. is Tmux is giving me some issues. Right, so this is our Docker, let me zoom in. Okay. okay, so this is our Docker file, hope is visible, right? So in the first line, we just use the Debian image as a base image. 
In the second line, we run apt update, and in the third line, we install htop. So yeah, so basically this maps one to one to the layers, right? So first is the base Debian image, second is when we run apt update, and the third is when we installed htop using a. Right, so now we'll dig into what each layer actually contains. I hope this is readable for everyone. You can see the manifest here that I just showed in the slides. So these are all the layers, and the a layer is just a tarball, right? And in that tarball is just a diff of all the files that were created or deleted with whatever command you ran. So if we look here, right, so the first layer just contains all the base files from the Debian image. And in the second layer, we ran apt update. So these were all the files that were changed or update or created by apt update. You can see apt lists. Yeah. Oh, it's just a diff. Like it's not a file system snapshot. It's just a raw tarball. The diff. And this is the third layer. This contains all the files that were created when we installed htop. So you have htop related files there. You have some of its dependencies like libnl, libgpm, whatever. That's in some in courses libraries also there. Yeah. So now when we run a container, all these layers are placed on top of each other, right? Obviously, if we do it the traditional way, like extract them one by one, that would be very slow. So what it does is we use a overlay file system, which is basically a union file system that allows you to do this, right? We, you have a base layer on top of that, another layer, and another layer on top of that. Right, so we can take an example, right? So this could be the base layer. And this could be another layer that contains a diff of whatever stuff. So say this is the htop file. It's not present in the base layer, but the htop binary is present in the second layer. So the, the file system will just route all reads and writes to that file to the corresponding layer. And obviously the base, the base files are untouched in this layer. So whenever we try to access a base file, say slash etc slash group, that would get routed to the base layer right? and all these are just directories right? a layer uh, so every layer is extracted internally by docker and all these directories are laid on top of each other okay and nothing in the directories is modified at all there is another directory called the upper directory where all the changes actually get written to so i'll just demonstrate this practically Oh, one thing. Let me. I'll just finish that and then. Okay. 
Yeah, so let me just is this command visible? The mount one. No? Okay. So when we mount an overlay FS, right? So as I did before, I've extracted all the layers in order. Okay, five minutes remaining. Oh shit. Okay, I'll just wrap this up and then give a practical demo of what I've built and then we'll wrap up. Right, so we mount an overlay FS. So in the lower directory argument, we pass every individual layer. So it reads, uh, the, it reads from right to left. So first it will have the first image as the base layer, the second on top of it, and the third again on top of it. Right? And the upper directory is where our changes will be written to. So whatever changes we make in the final directory, they'll get written to the upper directory rather than modifying any of the layers. Right? And work directory is just an implementation detail. Like it might store intermediate files there to provide guarantees like atomicity or something. Yeah, it's possible, but say when you push to the Docker registry, right? It helps you with a lot of deduplication. Yeah. No, it's building also, right? It's all cached, so only the layer that has changed needs to be rebuilt. That's the purpose of this. Right, so this is the merge directory where all the layers have been placed on top of each other. So here we can see we have htop. And now any change I make in this merge directory, that will get reflected in the upper directory rather than any of the lower layers being mutated. So say I create a file one and maybe delete htop. Right, so in this upper directory, we can see we have the one file that has been created. And htop has been, and a reference to the htop file has been created here. This is not an actual file. This is just a character device that tells overlayfs that this file has been deleted. So if you know character devices, they're just basically special devices that have a special meaning to the kernel, like slash dev null slash dev u random. So yeah. So you can see htop is a character device with all these attributes that lets overlayfs know that this file should not be shown in the final directory because we've deleted it. Okay, so this also allows like in each layer, if you delete a file that was created by a previous layer, it won't actually get deleted. A dummy file like this would just create be created in the layer. So overlayfs knows, but the image isn't mutated at all. The layer isn't mutated. Okay, any doubts about this? This one, right? this last, last, no doubts, okay. Hmm. Should have timed this better. So I just cover one thing and one more thing I'll cover, like how when we push and pull from the registry, how it's all represented. Right, so this is just an example. So when we pull the Postgres image, we first get a manifest from the Docker registry. And this manifest just has the all the layers that make up the image. And we can fetch all these individual layers via their SHA-256 SHA sum. And just as I described before, we'll download all these layers and we'll overlay them on top of each other. And another thing that's present on the registry is the That's just the image config. It tells us what all environment variables should be set, which command should be en the entry point, what argument should be passed to it, and all of that. And what signal we should terminate the container with. OK. 
okay and now i'll just give a 30 second demo of what i built using all this all these apis so it's actually capable of running any arbitrary image off of the docker hub so okay the project is called dubba.rs as in container.rs so So what we do first is we obviously get the manifest that I just described. Then we get all the layers that are present in it. And then we download the layers one by one. So for example, here we're downloading the first layer. Actually, I should have cast. Okay. So what I do is download all the layers and then we'll run the container. I just demo this with Alpine since my net is very slow. Okay, yeah. right. right, so we're in an Alpine container here. A network has been set up. We have a PID namespace. All that fancy stuff is there. And we can also download files and all, any, everything like that. So, yep. So that was it. Hope you grasp some of it at least. And yeah, you can view the repository on GitHub. If you're interested, you can go in depth. So this is the repo. You can find it under my username, just dubba.rs. So you can, I've documented the code quite a bit so you can figure out what all what all what each argument to each says call means okay and thanks for listening to me hope it wasn't too terrible i've not given many talks before yep that's it Uh, thank you so much, Pratham. Uh, that was a very informative talk. Uh, I hope all of us, all of you got something to take from that talk, right? Um,